Welcome everyone again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future. And for all those that like great stories, I'm Ira Pastor, your life sciences ambassador along for the journey today. So on the United States uh, Center for Disease Control uh, website, uh, under the, the 10 leading causes of death list, uh, right below the, the two major categories of heart disease and cancer, uh, there is a category called unintentional injury, uh, which cumulatively took the life of over 167,000 Americans in 2018. Uh, this category consists of a variety of subcategories, including poisoning, traffic accidents, falls, drowning, fire, suffocation, just to name a few. Uh, when one goes to visit a parallel list, that is the 10 leading cause of, causes of non-fatal emergency department visits uh, and a non-fatal injury sort of broadly defined as bodily harm resulting from severe exposure to an external force or substance uh, or submersion, uh, the numbers go through the proverbial roof uh, with over 25 million cases reported alone in 2018 uh, with the combined direct and indirect cost approaching a startling three quarters of a trillion dollars a year. Um, we are honored today to be joined by Dr. Deborah Howry. Uh, Dr. Howry is the director of the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at the United States CDC. And in this role, Dr. Howry leads innovative research and science-based programs to help prevent injuries and violence and to reduce the consequences of them. Uh, prior to joining CDC, Dr. Howry was vice chair and associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Emory University School of Medicine and an associate professor in the departments of behavioral science and health education and in environmental health at the Rollins School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Howie also serves as attending physician at Emory University Hospital and Grady Memorial Hospital as the director of Emory Center for Injury Control. Uh, her research is focused on injury and violence prevention in addition to the interface between emergency medicine and public health and the utility of preventative health interventions and screening for high-risk behaviors in the emergency department. Uh, Dr. Howery has received numerous uh, national awards for her work in the areas of injury and violence prevention. Uh, she was recently elected a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, she received the first Linda Saltzman Memorial in uh, Intimate Partner Violence Researcher Award from the Institute on Violence, Abuse, and Trauma, and the Academy of Women in Academic Emergency Medicine's Research Award. She's the past president of the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine, Society for Advancement of Violence and Injury Research, and Emory University Senate. Uh, and she served on numerous other boards and committees, uh, author of over 90 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters, uh, received her, both her, uh, her medical degree and her master's in public health from Tulane and completed a residency training at uh, Denver Health Medical Center. Uh, all that being said, Dr. Uh, Howie, thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to, uh, to join us today. Absolutely. Delighted to be here. Thanks so much. Um, you know, typically, we start off the show by, by giving our guests the floor for a little bit just to, to introduce themselves. If you can take a few minutes to sort of go into you know, where you grew up, how you developed this interest in, in science and medicine, in emergency medicine, and a bit of your, your journey between the obviously the emergency room and now this very important leadership role at CDC. That'd be great. Sure. So I grew up outside of Washington, D.C., and my uh, father and my sister are both in the federal government. I uh, did not see myself working for the federal government when uh, I was growing up. I, uh, I went down south for uh, medical school and for my undergraduate and just was like curious all the time. I always had lots of questions of like why things happen and how can I fix things. Had thought about anthropology or archaeology mm -hmm. um, as an initial career. Just really like that whole um, intersection between science and humanities. Um, but was just really pulled um, into the field of medicine, particularly in college. I was just volunteering um, at Grady Memorial Hospital and kept finding myself drawn down to the emergency department. And just for whatever reason, that was just, I was just loved um, to seeing people being treated in their immediate time of need, um, regardless of whether they had insurance. Um, everybody at some point in their life, you know, needs to go to the emergency department, whether it's for injury, for a chronic disease, anything, and mm -hmm. just really being there um, in people's critical time of need is something that really appealed to me. So when I went to medical school, um, Tulane offered the opportunity to have a master's in public health at the same time, a combined degree. Mm -hmm. um, and I hadn't honestly really thought much about what that meant till I was in the program. And then I realized the importance of not to take care of the patient in front of me, but 
having a population level approach and focusing on prevention. Mm -hmm. I uh, continued my uh, interest in emergency medicine and did some research while in medical school and then went to Colorado for my training because they had done a lot of research really on intimate partner violence and other types of injury prevention research that I thought was important to continue to do in my training. And then I ended up in Atlanta after that at Emory for about 15 years. Um, mm -hmm. Art, Art Kellerman was another MD, MPH with a lot of interest in injury prevention. And so I really went to go work with him um, and had NIH funding, CDC funding for a lot of my research and partner violence and mental health issues. As you mentioned, I um, received a center grant to really build up the Emory Center for Injury Control. And I loved that. There I was able to pull together many different institutions, dis disciplines, um, all focused on how do we prevent things like drowning, child abuse, mm -hmm. um, suicide, and was teaching courses in the School of Public Health on injury and violence. Just had really found that nice, um, really intersection of all my passions and my interests. Um, and then the opportunity at CDC opened up and I saw that this was the opportunity for me not to do the individual level research and work that I was doing and to have an opportunity on the national level to really mm -hmm. impact programs and policies and um, have been here for almost six years and can't imagine doing anything else. It's just been a tremendous honor to be here. You know, when, when, when people typically hear um, CDC, I guess that, you know, the first thing that pops most people's mind is, is sort of infectious diseases, but you know, if, if one looks at, you know, obviously using this word in, in, in today's environment, but one of looks sort of looks at pandemic as we're sitting through one nowadays, um, when do, one just looks at sort of the, the numbers involved in sort of your domain with what you oversee at CDC, um, I mean, it's off the scales in terms of the numbers across all of these areas. Could you talk a little bit about sort of a general overview of of your domain at CDC, and you know, we, we've had folks on from, from NIH uh, as an example. You know, obviously they they have the sort of the medical um, uh, sort of the campus there in Bethesda, but also all these sort of extramural grants and research that's going on. Talk a little bit about sort of you know uh, the people that are working for you. You know, where your research occurs. I mean, I know you were there in Atlanta, but sort of a little bit of structure of, of everything that you oversee. I think that'd be a really nice way to sort of lay the ground for some of the other topics. Sure, so um, our center has had some tremendous growth over the past few years. Um, we have currently three divisions in our center and some of the topics include, we've got the Division of Overdose Prevention. So there we're really focused on opioid overdoses, but also things like cannabis, mm -hmm. um, illicit opioids. And we also are now o overseeing and running the Drug-Free Communities Program, which is in over 700 local communities. Um, most of our work around drug overdoses focus on funding state health departments and local communities around prevention. Things mm -hmm. like state prescribing, prescription drug monitoring programs, and working with public safety on local interventions. We have a division of violence prevention, and that includes things like child abuse, sexual violence, um, as well as firearm violence, which we received an appropriation from Congress this year. Uh, so we'll be issuing some R01, or research grants for firearms this year. Okay. The majority of our work is focused, again, with local communities and state health departments, really on prevention. We've developed things called technical packages, which I don't necessarily think the name is uh, user-friendly, but it's uh, strategies that are both policies and programs that states or communities can implement to prevent violence. So things like um, you know, home visitation for parents or um, after-school programs for youth, all um, some evidence-based programs that really work to reduce those types of violence. And then our third division is injury prevention, and that includes things such as self-directed violence or suicide, mm -hmm. and then other topics around unintentional injury, such as traumatic brain injury, older adult falls, drowning, and uh, traffic uh, mm -hmm. injuries. We also there support our um, injury control research centers, and then we also have some core state health department uh, programs as well, 23 state health departments, to where we really build injury and violence capacity and look at how we can walk, really work across um, sectors and topics. 
So um, starting with one of those topics, and, and you know, this is a theme we discussed a bit on the show in the past, namely the opioid epidemic. Um, you know, we've had some guests on from uh, DEA, so sort of looking at things from the, uh, the enforcement perspective of, of the more illicit stuff, the heroin uh, and, and so forth. Uh, we've also, you know, talked to some people in the, that are in the sort of the drug development space, looking at ways we can create novel uh, opioid antagonists and whatnot. But uh, your purview is really over sort of this over-prescribing segment, these two million plus sort of, um, sort of folks that have uh, that are taking the, the, the legal prescription pain relievers. Um, you know, we have the pain clinic problem, um, the fentanyl nowadays. Uh, talk a little bit about sort of some of the programs that you have going on there uh, in terms of um, sort of controlling that uh, over prescribing because that's such a, you know, uh, something we're really all very deep in nowadays. Uh, I, I think that'd be really interesting to hear sort of what CDC is involved in from that end. Sure. So um, we are doing a lot with health systems, as you had mentioned, and one of the things that I, I think was probably one of our signature activities was a few years ago, and that was development of our guideline for prescribing opioids for chronic pain in 2016. We had seen a significant increase in overprescribing for prescription opioids, and when you really look at overdose deaths, um, at that time we saw almost in parallel just the number of deaths due to prescription opioids going up really lockstep with prescribing. So we, we thought it was really important to focus on primary care where the majority of opioids are being prescribed mm -hmm. and just give some general guidelines for new patients that would be starting chronic opioids. This was not intended for cancer patients or end of life or patients who had currently been on opioids. It was around how do you initiate opioids for chronic pain and when. Right. And we, you know, went through a rigorous process looking at reviews and engaging stakeholders. It's almost been five years now since that guideline. So one of our activities is now we are working with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, HRQ. Okay. And they are updating their chronic pain systematic reviews and doing some on acute pain. And okay. so we are taking those reviews now and looking at updating our guideline. We will be having a board of scientific counselors meeting later this month to really talk about updating the guideline and defining who will be in that opioid guideline work group to really assist us with reviewing the evidence and determining where to update it. You know, what is the scope? Do we include more on in acute pain? This is we've heard a lot from things like dental offices. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we look at that? And then just with the new non-opioid and non-pharmacological treatments, there's more evidence around this. So building in that for specific conditions. So that will be one of our big undertakings around prescribing. We also didn't want this to just be something that would be like a long document that wouldn't go anywhere. So we sure. developed things like a, a mobile app, um, which I have on my phone. So, you know, when I'm trying to determine what is a, the right morphine milli equivalent, right. uh, I didn't calculate that before, but now the app can help me decide like where am I at with my prescribing. Mm -hmm. um, and it also helps with things like, you know, cognitive interviews with patients. So how do you have some of those difficult conversations and really have them open-ended so it's bi-directional and patients are comfortable talking about their understanding of opioids, what risks and benefits that they, they are comfortable with. Um, and then we've also done some quality improvement work for hospital systems so that they can look at things like urine drug testing, telehealth, how do they build safe prescribing into their practices. Are you, you mentioned um, as, as part of sort of this segment of, of CDC, a uh, cannabis a, a, as well. Um, I'm just, I was just very interested in sort of, you know, with everything going on now in terms of decriminalization and, and legalization in, in that context. Um, are you seeing any interesting trends at CDC yet about sort of what's going on here? Are we, are we seeing any overprescribing? I, mean, I, I just, I happen to have a, a mother-in-law that recently here in Philadelphia got her, her medical marijuana thing, a license, whatever it is. Um, you know, she's in her late, you know, mid eighties. <laughs> um, any interesting trends uh, that uh, you could speak of yet with regard to uh, how this may be, um, getting out of control if it is or, or not, or any insights, insights there that could be rather interesting compared to the opiates? Sure, and, and I think one of the differences between cannabis and opioids is um, opioids are legal in every sure. state, and cannabis, it, it varies on state, whether it's medical, recreational, et cetera. 
Um, so it's it's not apples to apples per se. Right. Sure. Um, we are seeing more youth initiation of cannabis and the, yeah. the rates of cannabis going up. I think when you think long term about the impacts on the brain yeah. with you know, how you're going to do with schooling and impulses, um, as well as some mental health issues that, you know, is concerning. I think one of the trends we've been really tracking though is around illicit opioids, particularly things like fentanyl. Sure. We are seeing, you know, um, a continued issue with drug overdose deaths in the U.S. And what's really driving that currently is illicit opioids or fentanyl, just really mm -hmm. that potency of the drug. Um, so that's an area we've really been trying to focus on as well as increasing our surveillance capabilities. We now have um, syndromic surveillance, which really just means collecting data through ERs, almost okay. in real time, like we have done with our um, coronavirus or with um, food safety issues. Mm -hmm. So we can tell our ER visits going up for different conditions. So now we're tracking that for non-fatal opioid overdoses, as well as all drug overdoses. So if a community sees that they're getting a hot spot, they mm -hmm. know, let's get naloxone there. Let's get some patient navigators there. Let's do some, you know, public service announcements around what's going on. And let's prepare, you know, healthcare for sure. these searches. So we think that's really important as well. Very interesting. Thank you for that. So, you know, within the, um, the non-fatal uh, emergency department visit um, data, at CDC, you know that, that there's that top category of, of unintentional fall, uh, and and the the number of I think some over eight million. Obviously, the costs um, involved with the volume of these cases are staggering. Um, and anyone that has you know an elderly parent, a grandparent in the home, you know has experienced the, you know what might seem like oh someone's fell fall fell down, but it leads to the surgeries, the in, in cases the overprescribing and a variety of sort of comorbidities associated with um, these conditions now really. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what we're seeing on this front? And then, you know, we, we discussed on the show sort of this, um, the technological themes that are coming in terms of aging in place, this concept that, uh, you know, in the future, you know, people want to stay in their homes. Uh, they don't want to go into a nursing home or so forth. Uh, we have to make the home safer. Uh, we have to, you know, create the smart home, uh, the, the internet of things in healthcare, where everything around us, people want to, they, they want to get, they're, they're getting older, but they want to stay in their home. They want to stay active in their home as they get older. Can you talk a little bit about some of you know, what you're seeing on the front in terms of new technologies that are coming to deal with this, this staggering amount of, of falls? Absolutely. And I do think with our aging population, you know, this is of great concern. Um, you know, more than one out of four older adult people fall each day and one out of five falls call, can cause a serious injury like a broken bone. And I think, you know, it's not just the fall itself, it's what happens after that fall. Yeah. Um, if somebody is not able to be ambulatory, you know, they have decreased quality of life, might be prone to other um, medical complications as a result of that fall. And so I think looking at ways to prevent falls from happening in the first place or mm -hmm. identifying those um, that have had a fall and are at risk for another fall is really important. We have a program called STEADY, um, which really is helping hospitals or primary care physicians screen older adults um, for issues. So things like, are they on blood pressure meds mm -hmm. that might be causing them when they go from sitting to standing to be more dizzy? Um, there's some blood pressure meds that work better than others in the elderly around things like orthostatic hypotension, so, so addressing that. Things like some um, sedatives or antidepressants also might make you know, older adults more prone to falling. And sometimes it's the combination of those medications. One might be okay, but if you're on two or three medications, you might have more of these sedation um, or, or dizziness from these meds. So looking at that, looking at strength and balance. You know, and if you can start to pick up some early um, strength issues or balance issues, referring for physical therapy or occupational therapy, mm -hmm. and doing things like um, home safety checks are, are really important. We've been funding some work through some of our entry control research centers around how do you do more virtual, you know, home safety checks to where it's not just is there a carpet, you know, it, it, that somebody might trip over, but mm -hmm. having a better mm -hmm. sense for how somebody gets out and about. And, you know, you had mentioned more virtual or aging in place. And, and I agree. One of the things that we are um, funding as well as a, a 
program to look at virtual physical therapy at home. And okay. I think in things like this COVID era right now, when people are at home more, looking at ways you can do more things at home, because the last thing we want is for um, an older adult just to be sitting <laughs> yeah. on the couch and not being active, because then they are going to be more likely to fall because they don't have that strengthening. So looking at ways to, to really do that. Um, falls is a tremendous problem in the U.S. And I, I think through screening patients, or through looking at um, home safety, and really looking at things like this virtual physical therapy would make a difference. So, you know, you mentioned um, that obviously one of the, one of the segments uh, of your um, area at CDC, which deals with I'm sorry, there's extremely hard forms of intentional injury it has to do with uh, both sexual violence and uh, child abuse, uh, and I guess the, the hybrid area. Um, obviously, there's a, a tremendous amount of um, lifelong trauma, uh, the issues that come along both mentally and then obviously physically in terms of, uh, I've seen a bit obesity and, and uh, depression, suicide, and so forth. Um, at the same time, and I, I just, you know, I had to wrap my head around, I, I, I pulled up this uh, 2011 study, this, uh, this global meta-analysis, um, which is, sh you know, shocking in its own, I mean, I, you know, I, was in, I don't look at this stuff too often, but this, this global prevalence of 12 to 18 percent for girls and 7 percent for boys, there's something, obviously, you know, <laughs> the Jeffrey Epstein story is in the, in the news a lot lately, but it seems like there's something much bigger going on. And I don't know, you know, how, obviously you deal with the downstream stuff, but are there things that we can do in terms of this prevalence of these things happening in the first place? Obviously, this is uh, a very complex set of issues, but if you could talk through a little bit about um, what you run into on this front, that'd be great. Sure. And, and you know, you're, you're spot on. I think um, our, our three key priority areas at our center are drug overdoses, suicide prevention, adverse childhood experiences, and it's because they're all linked. Okay. And I think when you look at something like adverse childhood experiences, that's how, if you can prevent them, long term, you can have an impact on things like drug overdose deaths and suicide. Adverse childhood experiences, um, we define them as several different things. It could be child abuse, it could be witnessing violence in the home or witnessing, um, you know, a, a parent's death from suicide um, or experiencing, you know, as you also mentioned, things like child sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. um, we had a publication come out just this past year looking at the prevalence of adverse childhood experiences in U.S. adults. And one in six adults had four or more of these adverse childhood experiences. And when you look at some of the leading causes of death, five of 10 of them really can be contributed or attributed to ACEs. Mm. And, and one example of that is if we were able to decrease these adverse childhood experiences, our okay. study found that about 44% of depression um, could be reduced. And so people will say, well, that's something that happened years ago. There's nothing I can do to prevent it or some of these things are inevitable. And no, um, you know, I'm an optimist. I believe there's always something that we can do, and we do have some evidence-based programs to prevent adverse childhood experiences. There's things um, like uh, school programs or community-based programs like strengthening families where you involve kids and parents around some social-emotional learning. Mm -hmm. um, there's learning different um, conflict management skills and life skills. Um, some of the after-school programs connecting youth to caring adults can really provide a lot of protective mechanisms. And then early on in childhood, things like nurse family partnerships or these home visitations can really help parents, you know, know um, safe parenting skills and help with other stressors. I know, you know, I was a, when I was a new parent, um, I, I relied a lot on different um, parenting programs. I looked at some of the mm -hmm. CDC's Essentials for Parenting um, programs, particularly their um, toddler webinars that they had. Being a parent can be tough, and if you don't have that social infrastructure in place, yep. th that's where I think a lot of these programs can really help. Um, and as we get older, I think things like bystander programs are really important for things like sexual violence. Mm -hmm. That's where um, there's been a program called like Green Dot to where um, different college campuses have implemented this and trained people. How do you look for signs of sexual aggression? What do you do? How do you intervene? 
you know, not just to, you know, turn away, but how do you actually become a bystander and change peer norms? Mm. And I think that's really important. Um, and then we have a program too, Dating Matters, which really focuses on 11 to 14 year olds mm. to talk about what is a, you know, a safe relationship, a good relationship um, to really prevent a lot of this violence from happening. I have to ask you about, you know, gun violence. Uh, obviously, this is a a huge issue, especially in the last few weeks. Um, I said you're in, in, in Philadelphia, but we're seeing, you know, major uh, upticks in, in gun violence all over the place. Um, obviously, you know, there's, there's a, the whole NRA Second Amendment issue, but we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about the CDC and, and sort of you know, what, what types of things you're looking at at CDC in terms of uh, you know, how we can prevent somebody from just picking up a gun in the first place. You know, what are the, obviously there's a lot of connections between, you know, historical violence, uh, what we see in the home, um, interesting insights, interesting programs that uh, CDC is going to be coming out with on these fronts. Sure, and I'll start with um, two programs that we currently have, and then just talk a little bit about, you know, where we hope to go. And, yeah. and so with, we currently have the National Violent Death Reporting System. Uh, through Congress's uh, appropriations over the past two years, we're, we are now in all 50 states. Okay. When I started here um, back in 2014, we were only in 18 states. Okay. And we've built up to 32, 40, now all 50. And, and that allows us to combine data from multiple sources. So okay. like vital statistics, um, medical examiners, coroners, and law enforcement. And it includes things like homicide, suicide, as well as... Um, uh, legal intervention deaths. And what is really helpful about the system is for things like suicide or homicide, what led up to that? You know, like particularly, let's take suicide. Did, was there, um, had the person been in treatment? Were they on medications? Was there a suicide note? With homicide, you know, was it related to intimate partner violence? Um, if there was a gun at home, how was it stored? So really knowing a bit more about the circumstances are really helpful and states have their own data and can drill much down to more granular levels. Mm -hmm. We publish each year a surveillance summary on these results and um, I think that's really helpful. Um, on the prevention side, we have youth violence prevention centers and these are really a community academic center partnership. Mm -hmm. And we, we look at, at how we can have evidence-based interventions in these different communities. And I think um, a good example is one from a few years ago, Baltimore has a safe streets program. Okay. And it's similar to like the cure violence model with violence interrupters to where you have people that may have had um, experiences um, with a criminal system or with gangs before who now, you know, are looking for ways to prevent violence in their community. So they help with de-escalating incidents as they're happening. And because they're known to the community, they're a known entity and trusted much more than if I went in as a mm. public health professional. And so I think looking at programs like that can be really effective. Um, with the new funding we've gotten, we're going to do something similar to what we're doing with our drug overdoses with the non-fatal. Okay. We're gonna fund some states to collect non-fatal firearm um, injuries in more near real time through the syndromic system. Okay. We're also going to look at our national violent death reporting system and support some additional information around firearms and circumstances so that we can help guide prevention efforts. And then probably our, where the majority of our thing is going is on research. Okay. And we're looking at ways that you can prevent firearm violence, whether it's through things like safe storage or education or some of these youth violence programs or identifying those at high risk, like a suicidal um, person and how can you intervene to prevent a firearm death there. Mm. there so more to come on that. We're mm -hmm. literally going through scientific review this week of those applications. We'll be announcing, I believe, end of August, um, who's been funded. You know, you, 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 what you mentioned before, you, you jogged one other thing before I got to the, the wrap up question. I, I wanted to, to ask you about um, just to get CDC's perspective on this. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I live here in Philadelphia and for uh, about the last year or so, um, they've been trying to set up sort of the nation's first version of something called Safe House, uh, which is a I guess it's based on some European models where it's sort of a, a safe place for 
people to use illicit opiates um, and you know clean needles and, and and so forth. It hasn't gotten any traction yet. There's been a lot of back and forth and protesting and what have you. But I just was interested based on your overarching program there. Um, does CDC have any sort of views on this particular model uh, in the U.S. context? I mean, I, I I know it's elsewhere. Portugal and some other places use it, but any insight on that per se? So um, we're always looking for new studies and new programs, you know, when there's sufficient evidence, then we evaluate them. And I, I don't think there's been enough evidence in the U.S. at this point to evaluate it. Got it. Um, I do think things like syringe service programs that can link um, patients to medical assisted treatment mm -hmm. uh, and provide naloxone are really valuable. And then looking at ways to really prevent, you know, substance misuse in the first place. Um, which is why I think the drug-free communities program that we're now managing is really helpful because that's, you know, community-based and focusing on preventing youth initiation. Got it. Got it. Appreciate it. Um, typically, uh, you know, we'll come to our wrap-up question, and, and here we, we come back to you. Uh, basically, um, obviously, you've met a, a variety of fascinating people uh, throughout your career in medicine and emergency medicine and now in uh, in running uh, this very important area at CDC. Uh, this question is basically about important influencers and mentors over your career to date that uh, they might want to talk about. Uh, folks that, you know, if it wasn't for them, you know, Dr. Deb Howery would be uh, doing cardiology or law or something totally different. Anyone uh, you want to shout out to specifically that really kept you on the straight and narrow in this, in this career and uh, uh, you'd like to mention? Sure, and, and I've been fortunate. I'd say really throughout my entire life, I've had many different mentors and sponsors that have helped me. And um, I think that's really how I got to where I am is by having all these different folks. I think first was my dad, mm -hmm. you know, who really um, pushed me to do better in school and to always do what was right to who's very service focused on what we could do for our community. Um, very active in the church and giving back and doing some work with our prison systems as well and really instilled in me the value of service and really the value of pushing myself you know academically as well i think when i was looking at um, even residency programs jean abbott was one of my first research mentors and she was really good because i at that point i um was not married or ha had a child so i was very focused on work and she was always very good at saying yeah, you know, the research you're doing is, is really good. Let's look at this question. But what are you doing to be healthy and to maintain some emotional wellness? And that was tremendously helpful. And then um, a shout out to Art Kellerman, who um, was one of the reasons why I had moved to Atlanta. He really helped me figure out, you know, the MD, MPH and injury prevention was my mentor on several grants. Um, I took over the Emory Center for Injury Control from him and was able to really grow it. So he's been a big supporter um, of all of my work. Valerie Montgomery um, Rice is the Dean at Morehouse School of Medicine. And she really helped me think about additional training and broadening my scope. She helped um, my application for the Executive Leadership and Academic Medicine Fellowship Program. And I think that helped me think broader than just academic medicine. And honestly, it's when I was in that program that I started working on my application for the CDC. Mm -hmm. And um, when I've been at the CDC, I'd say Tom Frieden um, is amazing. I think just really helping you drill down data, what can you do to, to save lives, where can you have the most impact has always helped focus on that. Um, I still run things by him or talk to him from time to time because he is, um, Really, I'd say um, a huge public health advocate. And similarly, Ann Shookett has been really a great role model for me for a female leader in public health. And you know, how can you focus on where you have the most impact and really in delivering key messages? Wonderful, wonderful. Um, it, it's it's really been a uh, a fascinating conversation. Listening to everything you're doing, it's it's. Take my hat off to you if I had one on. Um, it's just a, an, an amazing um, portfolio of, of things that you're doing and um, really wishing you the best in, in moving forward with all of these. Um, for everybody that's going to be watching on the YouTube channel, 
uh, or listening on the various podcast networks, you've been hearing Dr. Deborah Howery, Director of the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at the United States Center for Disease Control, a uh, member of the National Academy of Medicine's Opioid uh, Collaborative, doing truly amazing things uh, to reduce the uh, to reduce injuries, to reduce violence, to reduce all their consequences. Uh, Dr. Howie, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you for everything you do uh, and for, for, for public health and safety. And thank you for moving the human story forward, as we like to say. It's, it's really been a wonderful time meeting you and hearing uh, all of your initiatives. Uh, really great stuff. Well, thanks for the opportunity to highlight the work we're doing here at CDC. We greatly appreciate it.